Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope that whenever and wherever you are, when you hear this recording, that you are learning how to trust your guides and that you're able to hear your guides. Now, if you're not able yet to hear them, you can speak with them and talk to them and ask them to show you signs. So, for example, if you ask, what kind of pet should I get? Because you want to get a certain kind of pet. Well, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everyone will be talking about their guinea pigs or their dogs or their cats or their birds. And eventually you're going to go, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I've heard the word cockatiel five times this week. That's weird. Maybe I should look into birds. Maybe that's my kind of animal. Maybe that's my jam. (laughs) Or whatever it is. You know, if you need to make a move, ask, ask, you know, prime creator, God, the universe, your God, your higher self, your holy guardian angel, whoever you trust whoever you want to learn from, you know, the one you want to listen to, you ask them, hey, I think I'm maybe not in the right city or even the right country and I need to know where to go. And next thing you know, uh, Olive Garden will have a commercial saying, fresh from Tuscany, these are the new menu things. And then you'll go to Netflix and they'll, they'll recommend Uh, under Tuscan sun and next thing you know someone will say oh you know hey I uh, just got back from Tuscany you'll be watching an old Seinfeld and they'll say you know who has a villa in Tuscany and there you go oh my god I've heard the word Tuscany five times this week oh my god maybe that's where I need to be Um, that's how it happens that's how it's always happened for me I don't know what is going on with unicorns, but last night, for example, (laughs) I get off of the show. I finished and published it, and I watched the Gilmore Girls for about 30 minutes, and they mentioned the word unicorn, and I thought that's really odd, odd timing. You know, it's not like they mentioned the word unicorn two and a half weeks ago when no one else was saying the word it's right when I did the unicorn episode, right after the word unicorn had come up a whole bunch of times. And today I woke up and I, I got my coffee and I went to Gaia.com and I wanted to watch this, uh, the interview with Extra Dimensionals a show I've been watching every day that I absolutely love, by the way. And, you know, they're channelers like me and, and they're channeling the Pleiadians and different beings and it's so cool because it's like they're getting very similar messages but yet all the channel messages are different from each other so I want to know and learn as much as I can about the Pleiadians so I'm so excited about that but in the middle of this woman who channels the Pleiadians having a normal interview she wasn't um, channeling at the moment her dog runs in and licks the face of this guy who's interviewing and this dog um, is just really special. You just tell, like, you know, and she says, oh, well, this dog is channeling the energy of the elves and the unicorns. In fact, as a joke, my family calls calls him uh, Elphicornius <laughs> or Elphicornus. And I just thought that is too weird. Like, what are the odds that I'm going to watch two shows on two different websites that mention the word unicorn within 24 hours? In fact, within 12 hours of my having published my show on unicorns. And I only do the show on unicorns because it it kept coming up. It's so strange. It's so strange. So I had to do it. And now God is telling me today... I asked again, okay, look, unicorns came up two more times after I finished the show on unicorns. I thought that's what I was, that was it. And he said, no, you've got to channel um, unicorns. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, are you kidding me? I have to channel unicorns? That's so cool. That is one of the coolest things ever. So I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm, I'm guessing maybe on the first. <laughs> I'm probably going to be channeling uh, unicorns on Wednesday, <laughs> the first of the new year. And he said, not a specific one, but the unicorn collective. I haven't even contacted them yet. I don't even know. I, I didn't know unicorns were even real. Just to be honest, I just thought it was a cool idea, like the narwhal or whatever, which they were real, but I don't know. I just, it's weird because I always felt like maybe Pegasus was real, which is insane, but unicorns, they can't be real, which that's also insane. They both are real, actually. <laughs> and what this all tells me is you have to stay open. You have to stay open to your guides. You always have to stay open to your higher guidance. Now, if you don't know how to do that and you're just joining us, go through my very extensive list of shows. Look up. You could actually do a Google search for this. Um, your spiritual guidance team, Metaphysical Soul Speak, the podcast. I know it's really long to type into a Google search, but you will find the episode where I tell you how to connect with your spiritual team. And if you do that, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn about your team and they're, and you're going to give them a special name and you could just say, Hey, you know, like my, um, my spiritual medical team is called Fox Glove. My last name is Fox, so, uh, you know, the name fit like Glove, Fox Glove. Makes sense, right? And they, they told me the name, and that's a fairy flower, by the way. In fact, Fox Gloves, they're very, very poisonous. Um, it's called Digitalis. It's good for heart medicine, but also they're called the fairy caps, and they have, like, the little flowers of, like, caps that you would imagine being little fairy hats. So they're, they're connected to fairies and the heart chakra. And so it was just kind of perfect. You know, I was working heavily with uh, fairies at the time. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I came across a book about working with your medical assistance program team. And that's how I, you know, from Michelle Small, right? That's how I arrived at that. But learn to trust your guide, your guidance, you know, go learn about your spiritual guidance team but connect with God. I even did a how to pray. That one might help you. Um, a lot of people just don't know how to pray. They haven't prayed their whole life or they've never gone to church or they did, but they resented it heavily and, and they want to know how to pray in a way in which is not religious, you know? So I did a show on that as well. So anyway, uh, but just learn to trust your guide because your guidance, because yeah, they're going to help you and they're going to come up. I mean, like you'll turn on the radio and boom, there's that word. Then you'll go listen to a friend and then boom, there's that word. Someone will come up to you and say that word or a newspaper will go across your path in the wind and, and that word will be right on the paper. Um, when you start listening to your guides and you ask them a question out loud and if you're not telepathic with them yet, this is going to start happening and it's going to be insane. You're just going to be like, whoa, this is totally a trip. Just like, remember when, um, oh, Tim Robbins, he was in that movie where he had designed the hula hoop. I don't know if you guys saw the movie. It was so incredibly funny. I It's understated and funny, but it's a Joel and Ethan Cohen movie and such a lovely film, but in the beginning he's looking for, he just gotten a ride from Muncie, Indiana in New York City, and he wants a job, and it's like in the, it's set in the 40s or something, and and so he's trying to get a job, and someone sat there, um, well, a newspaper went across his face and went, like, you know, blew into his face, literally, they had the job that he should get on it, and he threw the paper down, and he ignored it, because sometimes we ignore our guides. And then he goes into the coffee diner, you know, to have his coffee because he couldn't even afford breakfast. He was broke. And someone sat the newspaper down and sat the coffee cup and the ring of coffee went around and circled the job he's supposed to get. You know, so that's like a perfect, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but that was a perfect example of exactly how your guides work. I mean, it's stuff like that. And it is, 
all around you all the time. I mean, cars pull in front of you on the bumper sticker or on the license plate. You know, a song will come up on the radio right when you're thinking about a certain thing. And the message in the song, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an, it's, it's incredible actually the way it works. So anyway, I just want you guys to uh, pay attention, just pay attention to the signs, ask questions out loud and they will bring the information to you. Just be open to it. And just the idea that you're, I'm going to be open to it. I want to connect to my guides. I'm going to be open to it. I'm going to ex- expand my mind to the field of possibilities. And then when you guys give me the instructions, I'm going to follow the instructions. And that's all you need to do. Just be willing to do all that. And bada boom, bada bing. You're going to be amazed. You'll, you'll absolutely be amazed. All right. I am going to read just a couple of headlines, not going to go too deep into it. I only have 30 minutes for the intro now that I'm doing this on the, on the, <laughs> now that I'm doing this on my uh, laptop, you guys know my situation. It's like my phone just is not working now, but I, the show must go on <laughs> as they say in Hollywood and in my bedroom <laughs> where I'm recording this. So, okay. Um, This one is really interesting. Russia is to build a nuclear-powered lunar base to track Earth-threatening asteroids. Well, I don't have a problem with Russia living on the moon or, you know, some people living on the moon. I don't have a problem with them tracking asteroids that might potentially threaten Earth. I don't know what they're going to do when they do see one. I do have a problem with the words nuclear powered. Last thing we need is a nuclear meltdown on the moon. We already have had several on the planet Earth, and we're still paying the price when we eat radiated tuna. I don't believe the nuclear powered part of this is necessarily a, a good thing. What do you guys think about that? If you go to watchersnews.com though, and you look at this picture of Earth and you look at a picture of the moon, you can fully see the man in the moon. And I'm telling you right now, I've never seen him before. They always say there's a man in the moon. I never saw it. And I, oh, I say faces and everything. <laughs> you do enough acid, you're going to see faces and everything. <laughs> but I'm looking at this going, this man looks more like a cartoon panda bear. You know, he just looks like a cartoon. He doesn't look like an actual man. So anyway, (laughs) but Russia to build nuclear powered lunar base to track earth threatening asteroids. I mean, it's like Austin Powers all over again, (laughs) building a base and build a moon base, right? Crazy. All right. In Australia, this is the headline. Get out now. More than 30,000 people are forced to evacuate East Gippsland due to extreme fire danger in Australia. Oh my God. I mean, it's just Australia, the whole continent's on, or, you know, I guess it's a continent and a country. It, the whole place is on fire. I, I'm just, I'm really sick about that. I hope that everyone, I hope you guys, if you're listening, in Australia, you know, our hearts are with you. We're praying for you. I I, I care about you guys, and I hope that um, I hope you can run to safety. My heart is broken already about the koala bears, man. I'm just, you know, I just I wish we could take all the rain that has flooded parts of Africa and bring it over to Australia to dump it on the fires, <laughs> or the other half of 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 uh, the continent of Africa, which I mean, a quarter million people are facing uh, starvation right now. So I hope that the 30,000 people get, um, get to safety really quickly and that everything ends up okay. You know, I've lived through several fires. It's just really, really, really scary. You literally feel like you're driving through hell when you're driving through a fire. Uh, okay. Moving right along. Um, 
major winter storm hits the United States with heavy snow and freezing rain. You guys, I'm looking at a weather satellite map of the United States right now on watchers.news and I'm looking at this going, oh my God, there's like a little part that looks like maybe, oh, it's next to, it's not Nebraska, I don't believe. No, it could be Nebraska. There's like a, a, a hole. So like there's like nothing going on in Nebraska and then in Texas, same thing. And parts of the um, Four Corners area, it, it's free, but then everything else is just completely blanketed white. It looks like Illinois might have a clear day for part of a day and that's it. Almost the whole United States is covered in white. Um, massive cloud cover. Heavy snowfall continues to batter northern Mexico. So, I mean, normally it doesn't snow in Mexico. So heavy snowfall in northern Mexico. This is, I swear to God, this have you guys seen the day after tomorrow? The day after tomorrow, Whitley Strieber, Art Bell, this is this was their idea. I mean, Whitley Strieber, I know you're not listening to this, but if you are, you're absolutely right. You know, someone came along, they wrote, uh, Art Bell and Whitley Strieber wrote The Coming Global Superstorm. They said this, this is the kind of weather we have in our future. And we must expect this is definitely going to happen as part of a massive climate cycle that happens. And they saw the writing on the wall. They saw all the signs pointing this way. And they were absolutely correct. And then someone came along and wrote a screenplay called The Day After Tomorrow based on their book. And then Whitley went and wrote the book The Day After Tomorrow based on the screenplay. Pretty crazy, right? But he wanted to get the, uh, he, he did that so that Whitley did that so he could get the uh, correct science um, put in the book. And I'm glad he did. It's cool. I actually have the book and I didn't read the whole thing. I was really, I had started reading it. But I love that movie. I've seen it several times. I watched, um, or I listened to every episode of Art Bell on climate change. You know, God rest his soul. Uh, Coast to Coast AM, man, back in the day, nothing better than that. Every single night. Yes, it was so great. Okay, guys. um, Disclosurenews.it. We've got, uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning, They say, um, UTC time, the situation changed suddenly at 23 UTC when a series of movements began and led the amplitude values to reach power 72 by 7 a.m. UTC time. From that moment onward, the amplitude remained on values between power 65 and power 80 with a peak maximum at power 82. And then the 1.30 in the afternoon report states, in the second part of the day shown in the graph, it's highlighted how the intensity of the variations has remained substantially unchanged and has generated the strongest peak of the day at power 93. It seems that suddenly as they started, the movements have rapidly dropped to normal values by noon. And then the evening report, today's activity lasted 13 hours from 23 to 12 UTC time. Today, you know, so from yesterday till today, the average was 70 and only once briefly for 15 minutes around 8 UTC time, the amplitude went below power 40. So graphically, it does look like a column of light and they're absolutely right. I'm looking at this. It's pretty big, pretty, pretty big. But the highest level it reached was 92 on the Schumann resonance scale. So that's in Italy. But hold on to your horses. Let's go over to a city maybe more nearer to you, depending on, I mean, if you're in Europe, that Italian one, that's probably where you guys are at. That's what's going to affect you. All right. So heartmath.org, this is the HeartMath Institute. They also take Schumann Resonance News um, information and they put it on a graph that it's, it's a 24 hour a day graph and all we have every day is like from noon until five and then the next day you have the rest of the graph is pretty much how it's going. So California started off at 61 hertz frequency at midnight and by 5 a.m. they were at 62. 
So basically, they just went up by one. Uh, Hafouf, Saudi Arabia remained at zero. Big fat goose egg the whole day long. Lithuania, 82, just like Italy. And aren't they kind of over there by Italy, actually, in the same continent anyway? 82 in Lithuania at midnight, and they went to 86 by 5 a.m. Now, uh, Alberta, Canada, they started off at 88 hertz frequency at midnight, and they went to 90 hertz frequency by 5 a.m. And I don't know, they're just they're just kind of riding it out over there in Northland, New Zealand. They're at zero. Just like Kofu of Saudi Arabia, absolutely zero, zero, zero all the way across. No change there for many days. And in Hulului, South Africa, they've been the highest number so far for weeks. They are at 250 or 214 hertz frequency at midnight. By 5 a.m., they were down to 211. And that's it for the Schumann Resonance News. I'm going to check quickly and see what, how many more minutes I've got left now that I have a deadline. <laughs> All right, we have yeah, nine whole minutes, so we got to get going on this. I, I did want to tell you guys about... Um, all right, got to now. I'm like scanning through all the things. Usually, I have it queued up because I'm doing this on my phone. Got to get used to this new system. All right, um, we are now still we're still at a solar minimum. Nothing came of what we were hoping were going to become sunspots. The uh, magnetism, the magnetosphere for the Earth, as well as the sun, it's like hardly any activity. There are no solar winds. In fact. The solar winds that looked like they were coming, just like all the activity dropped. And the sun is just like, there's no activity at all coming our way from the sun. What this does to us is it renders us sitting ducks. We are open, wide, open for all the cosmic radiation to come in. And this is how it affects you guys. It affects our moods and our mental states of mind. If you are mentally ill, if you are on medication for being mentally ill or ought to be, this is going to affect you way more than other people. If you are easily unhinged and super emotional, it's probably going to affect you on your emotional body level. If you have a heart problem, if you have palpitations or heart, if you're prone to heart attacks, it could affect you. Keep your pills next to you. Drink a lot of water. Get a lot of rest. Eat healthy, guys. Be safe out there. Um, the other thing, um, if you have autoimmune disorders or immune system issues or autoimmune disorders, so... Anything to do with the immune system, the cosmic radiation will definitely affect you. That makes sense because I I'm thank you God I'm better today. Better today, but I mean for like a few weeks I was just like having to ice my back every day. I was in so much pain that I couldn't stand it. And taking pain pills, which to <laughs> pain pills here are like ibuprofen and aspirin and Tylenol. There's like really nothing else here that I could get unless I went into the hospital and had a doctor sign it, you know, saying I could have a little bit of Vicodin or something, but they just don't have that here. They don't really have codeine. They don't, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, short of illegal uh, street cocaine, there's not really anything else I can do. So I was just icing myself, just icing my hips, my back, my knees, my ankles, my wrists, like every joint in my body. And now that I realize it's cosmic radiation, it's not always to do with the barometric pressure. It makes a lot of sense. So if you have arthritis or lupus or anything that is of a nature of being very um, bad for your immune system or autoimmune, it's going to maybe be affected when we get the cosmic radiation waves and pulses coming in. So just be aware and be uh, more patient and also diligent. Have your water, your healthy food, your just go to bed early if you have to. Do what it takes to stay healthy, guys. Be safe out there. All right, so we are on less than 201 in A Course in Miracles or ACIM.org. 
which is the website for the Foundation for Inner Peace. And we are in a review phase again. So yay, review. Lesson 201. And this is, uh, there's throughout the review phase, we're going to have um, the same sentence we say again and again and again. This is going to help you unravel some of your three-dimensional stuff. I am not a body. I am free. For I am still as God created me. And that's the thought that's going to be interwoven throughout this entire review. The first thought today is for, taken from lesson 181. I trust my brothers who are one with me. I trust my brothers who are one with me. No one but is my brother. I am blessed with oneness with the universe and God, my father, one creator of the whole whole that is myself forever one with me. I am not a body. I am free for I am still as God created me. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, Let's see here. Uh, get into this. <laughs> see how many minutes. Oh, good. I still have like three and a half minutes left. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for now. I'm going to take a quick break. And when I come back, we're going to have a discussion. I've been threatening to do this episode for a while. And God said, today is the time. I'm going to talk to you guys about a Christian mystic feminist named Hildegard of Bingen right after this message. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's high time you did. It is the absolute easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's absolutely free. Second of all, they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. You guys have known that I've been doing this for eight months using the anchor.fm app right on my cell phone and I have done it everywhere, right? I have recorded this in my living room, my bedroom, little cafes in Quito, Ecuador, all over Cuenca. It's so absolutely easy to make your podcast and editing is just a snap. Anchor also will distribute your podcast for you. And it took me about two and a half months to become syndicated. And now I'm available on Spotify, Apple podcast, and many more. And so can you, you can make money from your podcast also, and there's no minimum requirement. You get paid from your very first listener. It is everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. So please, if you are interested in making a podcast of your very own, do not hesitate to start with Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.
Well, that clip, guys, is called O Froden's Virja. Not what you think if you speak Spanish, you're laughing your butts off right now. I think it means virgin in Latin. <laughs> Not the worst possible word for a male body part. <laughs> But that is taken from a clip. Literally, this is music written by Hildegard of Bingen. And we're going to go over um, some things about her because she was a very special person. She was an early feminist and also a Christian mystic. Hildegard of Bingen, B-I-N-G-E-N, she, her name in German, she's German. Her name in German was Hildegard von Bingen. We say of, because I guess that's English for von. I didn't know that until right now. <laughs> but I'm looking this up on Wikipedia. I'm going to read a couple things from here, and then we're going to go to some other websites for our research. But she's, she's special. I, I saw um, a man was... Speaking about her once in a church that my husband and I went to, it was like a new age church in Grass Valley, California. And we were really impressed by all the things that we were taught about her. And she was very deeply spiritual and I believe she was a real saint. So, all right, we're going to go over some of the basics here. She uh, spoke Latin, probably German as well as Latin. And she was born on September 17th. That puts her right in the middle of Virgo, baby. <laughs> she was a Virgo. Oh, wait, that was when she died. I'm sorry. It doesn't say when she was born. It says, okay, so she was born in, in the year 1098. And then she died in, in the Virgo sun. Ah, oh, sad. 17th of September 1179 is when she died. So she's also called St. Hildegard and the Sybil of the Rhine. And she was a German Benedictine abbess. She was a writer and a composer, a philosopher, a Christian mystic, a visionary, and wait for it, a polymath. A what? Are you saying what? Polymath? I don't even want to do one math, let alone many maths, polymath. Well, guess what, guys? I found out tonight I'm a polymath, too. <laughs> uh, and, and you know what? We're in good company if you're one, too. A polymath is an individual whose knowledge spans a significant number of subjects, known to draw on complex bodies of knowledge to solve specific problems. Well, it sounds like a polymath is an INTJ, like I am, if you're interested in Enneagrams. And someday we'll go over Enneagrams, but not today. <laughs> so the earliest recorded use of the term in English is from the year 1624. So for polymath. So she didn't even know that term back when she was this. <laughs> but she knew a lot of things. She was very knowledgeable very incredible woman. She is one of the best known composers of sacred monophony, which is the most recorded in modern history. And she's considered by many in Europe to be a founder of scientific natural history in Germany. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm getting the chills when I'm reading this. I have a feeling that maybe she was from another planet or another dimension, like a very high dimension to put, go back into the medieval times. Is that medieval times in the 1000s? I don't even know. But she, it just seems like she came here for, for a purpose and her life purpose was to really blow people's minds <laughs> and show that women can be just as valid as men and her story has lasted over a thousand years already, so she did something right. <laughs> so in 
So she was elected by the fellow nuns in her convent as a magistra in 1136. She founded the monasteries of Rupertsburg in 1150 and Ibingen in 1165. She wrote theological, botanical, and medicinal texts, as well as letters, liturgical songs, and poems, while supervising miniature illuminations in the Rupertsburg manuscript of her first work called Scivias. This, er, there are more surviving chants written by Hildegard than by any other composer out of the entire Middle Ages. All right, Middle Ages. I knew it began with an M. So, <laughs> so she is one of the few known composers to have written both the music and the words. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. And the fact that it has survived this long amount of time and we now have it. And you just heard, I mean, that's beautiful, right? It sounded like an aria. I don't know if that's technically what the word is. But anyway, one of her works, the Ordo Virtutum, is an early example of a liturgical drama. It's the oldest surviving morality play in the world. She is also noted for the invention of a language that she constructed herself called Lingua Ignota. She literally made her own alphabet up. This woman was, I would like to say a Renaissance woman, but she was in the Middle Ages. What do you call it, someone who's a Renaissance woman in the Middle Ages? I don't know. I think we just call her Hildegard <laughs> or St. Hildegard. So she, uh, throughout the history, uh, they tried to formally canonize her. It's been complicated. Uh, many branches of the Roman Catholic Church did recognize her as an actual saint for centuries now. And on May 10th, 2012, only seven years ago, Pope Benedict um, extended the liturgical cult of St. Hildegard to the entire Catholic Church in a process known as equivalent canonization. And on October 7th, 2012, he did name her a doctor of the church in recognition of her holiness of life and the originality of her teachings. But it's like te technically he, he still didn't quite, uh, you know, say that uh, she's a saint. I don't know exactly why, but maybe some someday. Um, she's been canonized and beatified, but it's not totally... They call it an equivalent canonization. So she's like the equivalent of a saint, but not quite saint status. I don't know. The politics of the Catholic Church, well, they're beyond me. I don't, I don't want to even participate. <laughs> she was 81 years old when she died in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, she was obviously venerated in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, in the Order of St. Benedict, and the Anglican Communion, and in Lutheranism. So she was recognized by several churches. Um, she's a very special woman. She has a major shrine in Germany at Ibingen Abbey. So I know one person who might be going to see this now that I mention it. <laughs> Becca, I know you're hearing this. We just had a conversation a few minutes ago, and I just told you I was doing the show. So I want to know if you could send me pictures of it. I will put it on my Instagram. But Okay. Um, let's see. I wanted to talk a little bit about her life. Her early life. Um, Hildegard was born in the year 1098, as I said, but the exact date is uncertain. Her parents were Mechtild of Merxheim Nachet and Hildebert of Bermersheim, a family of the free lower nobility in the service of the Count Meginhard of Sponheim. Oh my God, it's more German than I thought I'd be speaking tonight. <laughs> and I know I wasn't even saying it correctly, so sorry because I don't speak as a Deutsch. Okay, I can't even say that right. <laughs> Sickly from birth, Hildegard is traditionally considered their youngest and their tenth child. 
although there are records of only seven older siblings. So that's weird. Maybe three of them died. I, it, it's kind of weird, right? Anyway, in her vita, Hildegard states that from a very young age, she has experienced visions. So she was, before she was even a nun, when she was a very little kid, she was given visions by God. She could see things, right? And it was, and it would give her um, a much different perception than other people in, in her world at that time. So her spirituality is thus. From early childhood, long before she undertook her public mission or even her monastic vows, Hildegard's spiritual awareness was grounded in what she called the umbra viventis lucis, the reflection of the living light. In a letter to Guibert of Jamblou, I'm not saying that right. Sorry about that, guys. Which she wrote at the age of 77. She described her experiences of this light with admirable precision. She wrote, From my early childhood, before my bones, nerves and veins were fully strengthened. I've always seen this vision in my soul, even to the present time when I am more than 70 years old. In this vision, my soul as God would have it, rises up high into the vault of heaven and into the changing sky and spreads itself out among different peoples, although they are far away from me in distant lands and places. And because I see them this way in my soul, I observe them in accord with the shifting of clouds and other created things. I do not hear them with my outward ears, nor do I perceive them by the thoughts of my own heart or by any combination of my five senses, but in my soul alone, while my outward eyes are open. So I have never fallen prey to ecstasy in the visions, but I see them wide awake day and night, and I am constantly fettered by sickness and often in the grip of pain so intense that it threatens to kill me, but... God has sustained me until now. The light which I thus see is not spatial, but it is far, far brighter than a cloud which carries the sun. I can measure neither height nor length nor breadth in it, and I call it the reflection of the living light. And as the sun, the moon, and the stars appear in the water, so writing, sermons, virtues, and certain human actions Take form for me and gleam. She was obviously very well written. So in her uh, monastic life, uh, she said because of, perhaps because of the, the visions uh, or as a method of political positioning, her parents offered her as an oblate to the Benedictine monastery at the Disembodenberg. That sounds so strange. Like disembodied Disembodenberg. Um, it's a monastery ruin in Rhineland Palatinate, Germany, and founded by Saint Disabod. Hildegard of Bingen, who wrote Disabod's biography, Vita Sancti Disabodi, lived in Disembodenberg for 39 years. Well, that's very interesting. It has a picture here on Wikipedia, but just to be honest, it doesn't look like a ruin. It looks like a really cool modern building. But she was offered as an oblate. Now, an oblate is a person who is specifically dedicated to God or to be of God's service. Oh, see why well, I'm kind of an oblate as well. Cool. I learned two new things, two new words to describe myself. I'm a polymathoblate but <laughs> okay um, all right so this was recently reformed in the palatinate forest okay i'm looking that up um that's in southwestern germany so basically that's that's uh where she was there for a while that's where her parents dedicated her to a life of service for god probably she had asked that 
you know, obviously, because why would they do that otherwise, right? Usually, parents want grandkids. <laughs> All right, so it's a, they don't really know the date in which she uh, in was enclosed in the monastery. But at the age of eight, she had professed um, with an older woman, Juta was her name, which was the daughter of Count Stephen, Stephen, Stephen II of Spanheim. I don't even know any of these people. Sorry, I'm not really up to date on my middle ages, uh, <coughs> middle ages people in Germany. Um, but uh, Juta's date of enclosure <coughs> was known to have been in 1112 the year 1112 when Hildegard would have been 14 years old. And so their vows were received by Bishop Otto Bamberg on All Saints Day, 1112. Some scholars speculate that she was placed in the care of Juta at the age of eight and the two women were enclosed together then six years later. So however it happens, you know, we know that they, that's where they were and that's where they are. I'm going to skip the rest of this because a lot of this is, um, let's see, a lot of this is just a bunch of Catholic stuff we don't want to hear right now. I'm sorry. Just If you do, you can go read it on wikipedia.org. Look up Hildegard of Bingen. So I'm going to talk to you, though, about her visions, because this is pretty incredible. So she said she first saw the shade of the living light at the age of three. And by the age of five, she began to understand that she had been experiencing visions she used the term visio, which is Latin for vision, to describe this feature of her experience and recognize it was a gift that she could not really explain to others. I mean, yeah, it's not like they have a new age section at Barnes and Noble in the Middle Ages, right? She couldn't just, you know, her parents couldn't just turn to like the local new age bookstore. So that must have been um, a little frightening for a while, not understanding what was going on there, I mean, especially being so young, you know. But she explained that she saw all things in the light of God through her five senses, her sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. And Hildegard was hesitant to share her visions, confiding only to Jutta, who in turn told Volmar, which was Hildegard's tutor and later secretary. Through her life, she continued to have many visions, and at the age of 42, Hildegard received a vision that she believed to be an instruction from God which was to write down what you see and hear. She was hesitant to record her visions. She became very physically ill. And illustrations recorded in the book of Scivius were visions that Hildegard experienced, causing her great suffering and tribulations. In her first theological text, um, Know the Ways, otherwise known as Scivius, she describes her struggle within, and she wrote, But I, though I saw and heard these things, refused to write for a very long time through doubt and bad opinion and the diversity of human words, not with stubbornness, but in the exercise of humility. Until laid low by the scourge of God, I fell upon a bed of sickness, then compelled by, at last by many illnesses, and by the witness of a certain noble maiden of good conduct, which was the nun Richardis von Stade, and of that man whom I had secretly sought and found, as mentioned above, I set my hand to the writing. While I was doing it, I sensed, as I mentioned before, the deep profoundity of scriptural exposition. And raising myself from illness by the strength I received, I brought this work to a close, though just barely in ten years. And I spoke and I wrote these things not by the invention of my heart or that of any other person, but as by the secret mysteries of God, I heard and received them in the heavenly places. And again, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, cry out, therefore, and write thus. Okay, so. Um, so Pope Eugenius, Eugenius uh, heard about Hildegard's writings. And it was from this that she received papal approval to document her visions as revelations from the Holy Spirit, and this gave her instant credence. And when she died on September 17, 1179, 
Her sisters claimed that they saw two streams of light appear in the skies and cross over the room where she was dying inside. So I think she was a saint for real. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to see. There's some other interesting things. I'm going to check my moments because this is going to just shut us off. Okay, we have like nine more minutes. <laughs> then we could go through this. Um, let's see. Um, now, her works included three great volumes of visionary theology and a, a variety of musical compositions for use in liturgy as well as the musical morality play Ordo Viturtum, which we heard one of the songs from that, which is one of the largest bodies of letters, 400 letters, that survived from the Middle Ages, addressed to correspondents ranging from popes to emperors to abbots and abbesses, and includes records of many sermons that she preached in the 1160s and the 1170s two volumes of material on natural medicine and cures, an invented language called the lingua ignota, or the unknown language. It, you know, it's almost like she wrote down her own form of light language, I think. And various minor works, including a gospel commentary and two works of hagiography. This, I don't even know what that means. Um, it says several manuscripts of her works were produced during her lifetime. And that included an illustrated Rupert Burke manuscript of her first major work, Kivius, which has had been lost since 1945. I guess they just found it again. She also wrote the Dendermond Codex, which contains one version of her musical works, and the Ghent manuscript, which was by which was the first fair copy made for editing of her final theological work, the Liber Divinorum Operum. At the end of her life, and probably under her initial guidance, all of her works were edited and gathered into a single manuscript called Reason Codex. All right, so visionary theology. Um, you could read about this, about all the things. Um, it kind of, it, it kind of like goes over some of the stuff I already said. So I'm not going to really read much, a lot the rest of this. There was something here, though, about this um, Ordo Virtutum that I wanted to tell you guys I thought was very interesting. Now, Ordo Virtutum is Latin for Order of the Virtues, is an allegorical morality play, and it's a sacred musical drama that St. Hildegard wrote in 1151 during the construction and relocation of her abbey at Rupertsburg. It is the earliest morality play by more than a century and the only medieval musical drama to survive with an attribution for both the text and the music, which she wrote, all of it. So she was, I want to say again, Renaissance woman. That sounds silly because it's from the medieval or middle ages times. But she was way, way far ahead of her time. And we should be uh, really grateful that we get to hear it. Um, I mean, I'm not particularly religious, but there's not. I mean, think about it. Even in the 1800s, there wasn't so much for a woman to do. You know, but marry right. <laughs> you marry the correct man, you're going to have a happy life. If you don't get married, you might end up being a beggar when your money runs out. You're not, you don't have a way to have a business. You don't have a way to um, take care of yourself financially. Right? So that's in the 1800s. Go back 700 years. And the only thing that she really could do is become a nun so that she would be taken care of. And she wouldn't have to do the whole marriage thing. There wasn't a lot of choices for women. And yet she took advantage of this and went on to become a really incredible person. So she was a Christian mystic, according to ancient.eu forward slash Hildegard of Bingen. Um, she was a Benedictine abbess, polymath, proficient philosophy, musical composition, herbology. Oh, that's interesting. Medieval literature, cosmology, 
medicine, biology, theology, and natural history. That's like really incredible, right? She refused to be defined by the patriarchal hierarchy of the church. And although she abided by the strictures of it, she pushed the established boundaries for women almost <laughs> past their limits, according to this article. So she, in very, in a very real way, the very first feminists in the world. <laughs> and here we thought the sexual revolution took place in 1970, but here in the 1000s, she was already pushing the limit and establishing boundaries for women that were beyond the boxes that men had placed them in, right? But along with her impressive body of work and ethereal music compositions, Hildegard is best known for her spiritual concept of greenness or feriditas, the cosmic life force infusing the natural world. Now, for Hildegard, the divine manifested itself and was apparent in all of nature. Nature itself was not the divine, but the natural world gave proof of, existed because of, and also glorified God. I keep checking the time here. I don't want it to run out on me. <laughs> okay. She is also known for her writings on the concept of sapientia or divine wisdom, specifically imminent feminine divine wisdom, which draws close to and nurtures the human soul. From a very young age, she experienced ecstatic visions of light and sound, which she interpreted as messages from God. Now, her visions were authenticated by the ecclesiastical authorities who encouraged her to write her experiences down. She would become famous in her own lifetime for her visions, wisdom, writings, and her musical compositions. And her counsel was sought by nobility throughout all of Europe. So I'm going to, uh, I only have like, Two minutes before this cuts off, so let's see. Um, it was really, I don't know, I'm just looking at this going, this is really incredible. Um, so it's saying that she was, uh, she came from an upper class driven family, basically noble family, and she was afflicted with headaches and had visions from the age of three. Now, I did read somewhere that they say it's probably that she had migraine headaches, but you know, three-year-olds don't normally get migraines. And usually if you start to have migraine visions, what happens is um, it's usually when your hormones are changing at puberty is usually when um, women tend to like around the age of, you know, from 12 on is when women usually will get migraine headaches. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like, she was having actual visions and it was making her head hurt because she was concentrating so hard on what it was that she was seeing. Cause of course she wanted to, um, speak with God, right. You know, to learn more about what was happening to her. So, all right, we're going to take a quick break and then start another, uh, section of this because of the um, I'm at 28 minutes and 47 seconds Ah, it's just sex I can't just go on for a whole hour like before I've got to get my phone fixed guys or get a new phone and I'll, I'll do that soon oh hala as God wills it um, alright alright so I'm going to stop the recording now and I'm going to pick this up in just a quick second Right, guys, remember when I told you that I was a, a not really attached, but being followed by <laughs> like thousands of um, spirits when I was in Ville. And I was still kind of formulating who I was as a shaman. I didn't realize 
it completely. I, I, I knew it a little bit, but I wasn't really embracing it fully. And I was resisting it highly. And I remember when the spirits just start all like poking my head and touching my head and pushing on my head energetically. And I got such a bad headache. It's like I was freaking out. I took medicine for it. It wasn't going away. I drank a bunch of water. I thought I was going to die. And I wrote to somebody who I knew in Cusco, and he he's also a shaman. And he said, that's because you have a bunch of spirits. You're waiting to release them to heaven. And I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot about that. They've been following me for hours. I was suffering for hours. And when I accepted it and I went ahead and helped them, my headache went away immediately. It was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Well, Hildegard was resisting her visions, right? And she, as she was resisting her visions, she was, it was sick. It, it just made her sick. So she re, she feared and resisted her visions and she was supported and encouraged though to accept them by uh volmar now volmar was she was allowed in her monastery to actually um like say you know like to be up in front of people and speak and talk about um the religion but she was not allowed to hear confessions so uh, Volmar was a monk and he was allowed to take the confessions that the mon that the nuns were not allowed to take because that's just the way that the church was structured at that time. So um, he was, he had, had served priorly to um, the convent as the nuns confessor, but they were also not allowed to celebrate the mass or preside over the official assembly other than the meetings of just only the women um, in regards to the day-to-day -day upkeep of their community. So he was kind of the monk that was assigned to them to help them with the church-related stuff that they were not allowed to. So sexist, but whatever. I mean, it's like uh, over a thousand years ago, so all right, whatever. Um, but he, he actually encouraged her to believe in the authenticity of her visions and to write about them. And he, uh, they believed that he taught her Latin, and introduced her to various forms of literature so she could write about her visions, you know, um, in an educated way. And so she was accepted into the faith after seven years, and he was one of her instructors during that time. And so one of the things about them moving into the church with Juta, uh, they, they literally paid the church <clears throat> to take their daughters. Even though it was officially forbidden to accept money from parents, nunneries would require a dowry for a girl to be accepted, claiming it would go to her upkeep, which of course it did. And the dowries took the form of deeds to land, cash, expensive clothing, and other similar valuables. Daughters of more poor families could not afford the dowry, and if they wanted to participate in convent life, they had to become maids or cooks. So uh, according to uh, scholars Francis and Joseph Guise, they commented on the attraction of the convent for young women in the Middle Ages. Like, why would a family want to do this? But this is why. This is what they said. For upper-class women, the convent filled several basic needs. Number one, it provided an alternative to marriage by whose families were unable to find them husbands. Also, it provided an outlet for nonconformists, women who did not wish to marry because they felt a religious vocation or because they thought marriage was repugnant or because they saw in the convent a mode of life in which they could perform and perhaps distinguish themselves. And the nunnery was a refuge of female intellectuals. So that, I mean, and, and imagine, you know, since, since this, their child was three years old, she's sick, she's bedridden ridden with headaches, she's having these massive visions that she can't really explain to her parents. How are they going to find a husband for that, right? That's probably what they're thinking. And then, but she it was more suited for the lifestyle of living in a convent than for just being in a typical you know, forced into marriage and now you have to cook and clean and take care of the babies and have the babies and all that. It's just, it seems to me that she went directly into the correct 
uh, path for her. There's not a lot of paths for women in the Middle Ages, right? So it says here, uh, Hildegard certainly did fit this paradigm of the female intellectual, and this is the article on ancient.eu, distinguishing herself from the vast learning, devotion to God, and her service to others. So she was unanimously chosen to succeed Juta um, in 1136 when Juta died. Juta was only 38 when she died, poor Juta. Uh, so from the time she was young, she feared and resisted her visions, but Bolmar told her, hey, you have to accept him and write him down. So a few years after she became the abbess, she began receiving the visions more vividly than before and with such frequency that she became bedridden. She confessed her visions to the abbot Kuno, who presided over her order and encouraged her to write about them. Of course, she refused. So the visions became more insistent and she had to write them down and interpret them for an audience. Okay, so... That's what the visions were like insisting she do. And she resisted until she fell into a delirium in which the visions constantly reoccurring demanded that she express them in writing. I mean, it gets to a point where you have to share your gift to the world, especially when God is demanding it of you. And it's just, you know, that's why I'm here doing the show. (laughs) And you just, it's like, after a while, you just have to, you, you become relieved when every time you share something with people and I kind of see it. I wasn't bedridden because of it, but I could see how this could happen, right? So she says, in this affliction, I lay 30 days while my body burned as with fever. And throughout those days, I watched a procession of angels innumerable who fought alongside Michael against the dragon and won the victory. And one of them called out to me, Eagle, Eagle, why sleepest thou? Arise, for it is dawn, and eat, and drink. Instantly my body and my senses came back into the world, and seeing this, my daughters, or fellow nuns, not actual daughters, who were weeping around me, lifted me up off the ground. They placed me onto my bed, and thus I began to get my strength back. I mean, that's like crazy, right? Like she, she'd fallen off her bed she, and she couldn't get up. So she was inspired by the visions as well as Abbot Kuno and Monk Volmar. And so Hildegard began to write her best known work, the Scivias, or Know the Way of the Lord, Scito Vias Domini. Okay. And she... According with the visions them, themselves, the instructions in her visions related what she saw and what she felt they meant. And by this time, she was a well-established visionary, renowned for her wisdom, much sought after for her counsel. Pope Eugenius read part of the Scivias, approved the visions as authentic revelations, which we'd already learned from the other website. <laughs> and he encouraged her to continue her work. So after a while, people went to disobey Disso Bodenberg to seek her out and afterwards would have been gently reminded by Abba Kuno to leave a, ge- a donation before they departed. So she kind of helped the uh, business there <laughs> a little bit. So um, let's see here. Basically, is, there's a little story here. It's talking about um, how she didn't want to move to Rupertsburg. And when she refused, she was, again, (laughs) bedridden. And she was informed that God himself was punishing her for not following the will in moving the nuns to Rupertsburg. So she was stricken with the paralysis so severe no one could move her arms or legs. After witnessing this, um, Kuna relented and allowed the nuns to leave. I guess um, she ref- she kept saying, look, we have to move over here. And he's, and Kuno said no. And then she became paralyzed until he said yes. And then suddenly she was better. <laughs> I don't think she did on purpose. I think she just literally, it's just, it sometimes if you don't follow the will of God, after you've given your life over to God, things can happen that aren't so good. So you always have to listen. Um, <laughs> So Hildegard's vision is an all-encompassing in scope, far transcending common visions of medieval church, of the medieval church, while still remaining within the bounds of the orthodoxy. She claimed 
that the divine was as female in spirit as male, and that both these elements were essential for wholeness. I mean, that's like, that's like really incredible, isn't it? <laughs> I agree with that, obviously, right? Right? Mother, Father, God. Yes. Her concept of verit- veriditas elevated the natural world from the church's view of a fallen realm of Satan <laughs> to an expression and extension of the divine. God was revealed in nature and the grass, flowers, trees, and animals all bore witness to the divine simply because they existed. Her fate, her, her work, which we've mentioned a million times, the skittiest, relates 26 of her visions in three sections, six visions in the first, seven in the second, and 13 in the third, along with her interpretation and commentary on the nature of the divine and role in the church as an intermediary between God and humanity. She depicts God as a cosmic egg. Now that's odd. Remember that story I read you guys like about two weeks ago uh, called the, the egg, the egg story. Very weird, right? Anyway, she depicts God as a cosmic egg, both male and female, pulsating with love. The male aspect of the divine is transcendent while the female is imminent. It is this Immanence or imminence, which invites rapport with the divine. So, yeah, so if you approach the female part of God, it's much more inviting. The male part of God is cold and mercurial, thinks it's like a, a thinking part. But the female divine, it's more of a mother and love, and it's a lot more um, approachable for a lot of people. Hildegard believed that prior to the fall of man, God was worshipped by celestial songs, which, after the fall, was approximated by music as humans now heard and understood it. Music, then, was the best expression of one's love for, devotion to, and worship of God. In keeping with her beliefs, she ends the CBS with a text of her morality play called Ordo Virtutum, which you guys heard a few minutes ago, and her Symphony of Heaven, one of her earliest musical compositions. Throughout her time at So Bondenberg, she routinely practiced holistic healing using resonant spiritual energies and natural remedies to maintain health, cure illness, and injury. See, she was so far ahead of her time, guys. Oh, my gosh. So, um... Let's see. She wrote a book called uh, Physica, which means medicine in uh, Latin, and the causes and cures of disease, causa e, e curai, curae, uh, I do not pronounce Latin. Um, also, Liber Supti Latum, the book of subtleties of the diverse qualities of creative things. Created things. She argues that human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation and the natural world exists in harmony with humanity. Humans should care more for nature. Nature will do the same. I mean, she was literally eons, light years ahead. Her concept of health was based on the prevailing understanding derived from ancient Greek medicine of a human body's health. that depends on the balance of four humors in the body, sanguine, peaceful, dry, uh, which is blood, and choleric, angry, hot, yellow bile, phlegmatic, apathetic, moist, which is phlegm, and the melancholy, melancholy, depressed, cold, which is the black bile. So Hildegard's conception of the humors differed slightly, but still conformed to the traditional understanding. And when the humors were in balance, the body was in optimum, optimum health, and sickness obviously meant an imbalance. Hildegard recommended herbal remedies, hot baths, proper sleep patterns, a healthy diet, and a positive attitude to help keep one in balance or bring a sick person back to a healthy state of balance. An essential aspect of health was virtuous conduct. And she, of course, addressed this in her morality play. And this depicts the struggle of the soul trapped in the flesh between the call of the virtues and the temptations of the devil. The work was performed by Hildegard and her nuns 
as a chorus of virtues and the soul, which is a female voice, male clergy singing the roles of the patriarchs and prophets, and most likely Volmar in the role of Satan, the only character in the play who does not sing because Satan is incapable of producing music, which is, of course, the true praise of God, according to her. (laughs) And this is the oldest morality play and the only medieval musical extant. So she, um, let's see, it's talking about some of her other works. Uh, she, she wanted always to look at the struggle of the soul in her works between virtue and vice and the true nature and final rewards of both things. And the reason for the soul struggle and the imminence of God's presence and the redeeming love. And in her works, she wrote the, about human sexuality. And she specifically, in female sexuality, she described a woman's orgasm as the spiritual force which enfolds the man's seed in the womb and holds it there. The depth of the passion that the parents felt for each other during sex would determine the child's character. If they were in love, then the orgasm of both would be strong and the child would be healthy and happy. If they were not in love, then the child could end up being bitter and in balance. That's very, very deep, isn't it? That's powerful. I've often thought that there was something to it. If you're not in love and you get pregnant, you know, it, I think it could be problems problematic for the child, not just because of what's going on around him, but genetically, because that's why... You know, a lot of religions say you probably shouldn't do it before marriage, right? And I say you shouldn't marry unless you're in love, you know? And I think that's a big, big um, point that she made there. So um, she wrote her grand theological opus, Liber Divinorum Operum, the Book of Divine Works. It drew together the themes of all of her previous works and elevated all through the grand scale of her further visions that she had, an explanation of the divine, uh, the nature of divine love, or caritas, and divine wisdom, sapientia, represented as feminine energies that radiate light. Now her concept of veritas, greenness, explored more fully in the work, the greenness of the natural world reflected Greenness of the human soul receptive to divine, which blooms to life once connected to cosmic life force. Cut off from the divine love, soul is at mercy of vice, which leads only to misery and death. But the natural and life-affirming choice is to embrace the divine as essential and enduring energy of existence, recognizing that all the virtues call one toward an elevated, transcendent reality. Music, of course, is intertwined with this concept of greenness as it does elevate the soul in praising the source of all life. So she, uh, even in her early 80s, she refused to be bullied or cowed by male authority figures. She was a true feminist and she went on speaking tours and the Archbishop uh, of Mainz had ordered her to exhume the body of a young man buried in holy ground at Rupertsburg who had died, and she refused. She claimed the man sought absolution, received grace, and it was only his personal stubbornness and pride which prevented him from recognizing this. She had traveled twice to Mainz to plead her case, and she was denied, and her convent was placed under interdict. But only when the Archbishop died was interdict. Uh, interdict, interdict, I don't know, lifted, and her Hildegardner nuns were regarded again as having been returned to a state of grace within the church. But she refused to move, exhume a, a body. You know, she was very powerful, very uh, stubborn in a good way. So, um, So she says, aside from her contributions to theology, philosophy, music, medicine, and the rest, Hildegard invented the constructed script of the alternate alphabet, 
and she used in her hymns for concise rhyming and possibly to lend her text a sense of dimensional, higher planes. She also invented the unknown language, so is literary ignote and the lingua ignota, unknown language. She gave this her own philological construct of 23 letters, which served to separate and elevate her order from the mundane world. So, in spite of her accomplishments and fame, the church continued to regard women as second-class citizens and dangerous temptations and obstacles to virtue. The highly influential Bernard of Clairvaux claimed that a man could not associate with a woman without desiring sex with her, and the canonical order of the Premonstratensians banned women from their order, claiming to have recognized that wickedness of women is greater than all the other wickedness in the world. It's like, really? Because it's the man who's having the idea, right? It was precisely this kind of misogynistic mindset that Hildegard struggled against, not only within the church, but in medieval society at large. But even so, the significance of her work has been recognized by the church. She was singled out as a woman of note. Four attempts to canonize her have been mounted and she's still always re- referred to as St. Hildegard of Bingen, but she's never been canonized, not even to this day. She's been beatified, but not canonized. Even though she did fit the criterion of a saint, at least many regarded her as so. And now they're, they're, they're basically saying, well, she just had migraines, and that's why we're not going to canonize her as a saint. So I think that's kind of BS. Um, let's see now there's another really funny thing that I read from this other place in atlasobscura.com it's talking about how um, it says recently groups of progressive nuns have become increasingly vocal in their opposition to the patriarchy and regressive social views of the Catholic Church however few have ever openly dressed down the church elders or even call the world leader a juvenile fool. This honor is held by Hildegard of (laughs) Bingen. Woo! You know what? Behaved women rarely make history. (laughs) She was brash and brilliant medieval abbess, author, herbalist, composer, prophetess, and visionary who ruled her own monastery. Yeah, girl. In Rupertsburg, high on a hill in rural Germany. So her teachings, opinions, prophecies told through her visions, referred to as illuminations and reflections of the living light, compelled hordes of people to visit her and made her a force to be reckoned with in 12th century Europe, within the power circles. (laughs) And so, let's see. um, She said when she was a child, uh, Hildegard Bingen said she was a child, she could not speak out. When she was three years old and she saw heavenly light and it made her tremble because she couldn't talk about it. But she really, uh, I don't know, she says, um, the, the visions which she claimed to experience while fully awake with open eyes terrified her. She says, when I became exhausted, I tried to find out from my nurse if she saw anything at all other than the usual objects Hildegard wrote. She answered nothing because she saw nothing like I did. Then I was seized with a great fear, and I did not dare reveal it to anyone. So this must have been really terrifying. It was a good thing she went into the monastery. But um, let's see. It it talks about the rest of her life here in this. uh, But she heard the voice of God. She believed it was God anyway. She wrote it down. Her thoughts were written down on wax tablets. She wrote down her visions and um, her uh, writings were translated into proper Latin by the monk and scribe Volmar. And her 26 visions were brutal and confounding and beautiful. And there have now been included artistic renderings of her visions at Rupertsburg. So, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Let's see. Um, 
Now, Oliver Sachs, um, who is a neurologist, he said later, it's very possible she suffered from severe migraines and possibly temporal lobe epilepsy. So they're not really sure, but uh, let's see. Uh, the, her descriptions of the showers of light were wavy lines and pain that accompanied her vision. So it's very possible she had migraines. It does sound like it. I can't believe she had migraines at the age of three, though. But it's very possible. Why not? You know, it's it's not impossible. Hildegard's uh, biographer, Barbara Newman, she believes that her visions were a canny way to have a voice in an overwhelmingly patriarchal society. And she said that Hildegard used visionary style and prophetic authority as modes of empowerment for women who would otherwise have no license to speak, let alone write or preach about the many things of God. And she was a great supporter of women and in many ways a proto-feminist. Hildegard often would rail against the womanish time she was living in, in where a spineless church and evil state tussled over prestige and power. So, um, anyway, I'm not going to go into uh, all of the things here. If you want to read this article, it is found on atlasobscura.com. Just look up the medieval prophecies who used her visions. No, that's not what it's called. No, the medieval prophetess who used her visions to criticize the church. I, I don't think she really did it on purpose, though, to criticize the church. But, you know, I'm not going to go into the bit uh, some of the visions she saw. They were a little bit horrific for me to go into for this. But, but she was very much um, stubborn and, and, and she refused to kowtow to the men just simply because they're men. And she, to the extent of her ability, she discussed God as being a woman. God is a woman and a man. And I think that's very, very progressive, especially for the medieval times. And I think it is worth having a show on her. And God told me today, today was a day (laughs) to finally talk about Hildegard of Bingen. So, um, anyway, she left so much work, like 80 songs about virgins alone. I mean, she just wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs and I don't know. I think that we have a lot, um, to be grateful for in her, um, work and in her early, you know, her early her early ideas, you know, that might have formulated at least women in that time. And it all led towards, you know, the feminine, that's a very early, early rumblings in the current feminist movement of today. You know, the patriarchy took over the matriarchy. And, you know, I think now, you know, when it was a matriarchy first and then a patriarchy, and I think now we need to recognize that we're all equal and we're all souls and our souls are genderless. And I don't know, I think that that might be where we're going next is have the divine masculine and the divine feminine completely uh, together, you know, in harmony. And that's what I'm hoping the fifth dimension will be for all of us. All right, guys, that's it. Please send me your prophecies for next year. I've gotten some answers to that. Metaphysicalsoulspeak at gmail.com. And I'm signing off. (laughs) I'm tired. Signing off with peace and joy and the high vibrations of the holy fifth dimension. I love you guys. Love each and every one of you. And I'll be back tomorrow with all original and unique programming. And until then, peace. Do you ever wish you could look into the next chapter in your book of life and see what's coming next? What does the universe have in store for you? I can help you with that. I will give you a Celtic cross reading, which is 10 cards, or you can ask me three questions and I use three cards per question. 
So that's nine cards, or I can channel your higher guidance, or maybe God directly for you. Maybe you want to talk to your dear departed Aunt Edna because maybe you have a few questions and she was the smartest person you knew. If your deceased relatives are available or your ascended masters, I can channel them for you personally. Let me have one hour to show you the future in your next chapter of your book of life. Readings are $75 and it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to complete. And for this price, you will also be hooked up to the healing grid around the planet for free, which means yours truly, me, I will be giving you Reiki 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. All you have to do is let me know. Metaphysical soul speak at gmail.com and we will explore your future together.